A reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Thank you for the reading, Mary Alice. Um, <clears throat> before we listen to God's message, I invite you to bow your heads in prayer. Merciful God, we praise you, we give you thanks for this day, for the ability and the opportunity to lift our voices in worship and praise, for the forgiveness you again extended to us today in the name of Jesus for your word that we were just able to read. And now you have a message for us. And I pray, God, that your spirit will open our hearts, open our minds, make us receptive for your message. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so Corrie ten Boom, in her book, The Hiding Place, writes this. It was in a church in Munich where I was speaking in 1947 that I saw him, a balding, heavyset man in a gray overcoat, a brown felt hat clutched, uh, hat clutched between his hands. One moment I saw the overcoat and the brown hat, the next, a blue uniform and a, vis a visored cap with its skull and crossbones. Memories of the concentration camp came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past this man, I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath the parchment of skin. Betsy and I had been arrested for concealing Jews in our home during the Nazi occupation of Holland. This man had been at a guard at Ravensbrück concentration camp where we were sent. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out. A fine message, Fraulein. How good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. It was the first time since my release that I had been face to face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk, he was saying. I was a guard there. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well. Fräulein, and again the hand came out, will you forgive me? And I stood there and could not. Betsy 
had died in that place, could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? It could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me, it seemed hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew it. The message that, that God forgives us as a prior condition that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive others their trespasses, Jesus says, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is an act of the will. And the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, and sprang into our joined hands. And then this healing Warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, I cried, with my whole heart. And for a long moment we grasped each other's hands, the former God and former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. Early one morning in Dacula, Georgia, Matt Swatzel was driving home from a 24-hour shift as a firefighter and EMS and had only 30 minutes of sleep. He was less than four miles from his home on October 2nd, 2006 when he suddenly heard what he calls the most God-awful sound I've ever heard. Swatzel, then 20, realized he had fallen asleep at the wheel and crashed. When he got out of his car, he saw the car of 30-year-old June Fitzgerald. She was pregnant, and with then a 19-month-old daughter, Faith, in the car. And Faith survived the crash, but her mother and unborn sibling passed away. And June's husband, Eric Fitzgerald, a full-time pastor, grieved the loss of his wife and child with close family and friends, including young people from his student ministry. And one young girl told him she couldn't help but think of how the driver of the car was feeling. And he told her she was right, that they should all pray for him. It was his opportunity to practice the forgiveness he had preached so many times before. You forgive as you've been forgiven, said Fitzgerald, referencing the Bible verse. It wasn't an option. If you've been forgiven, then you need to extend that forgiveness. And to start, Fitzgerald extended his forgiveness to Swatzel sentencing. As a county officer, he was facing a felony at harsh time, but Fitzgerald pleaded for a lesser sentence. I didn't see why this accident and and tragedy needed to ruin any more lives, said Fitzgerald. And Swatzel paid a fine and did community service. Fitzgerald's forgiveness 
has created a friendship now six years long, strong. And the men stayed connected by meeting at least once every two weeks, attending church together and eating meals at the Waffle House and other restaurants, just the two of them. At one time or another, we've all found ourselves in need of forgiveness or hurt by someone and in the position to offer forgiveness. It can be an incredibly difficult thing to do. Sometimes it may be easier to stay angry, cut off the relationship or ignore the wrongdoing, our own or that of others and just hope, you know, that it somehow goes away. Why should we bother with forgiveness? And how do we do it? That's the question for us today as we end the series on questions to God. In this passage from Matthew 6, Jesus is teaching his followers how to pray what we now call the Lord's Prayer. And this is part of a bigger teaching on how to live out our faith. And so Jesus talks about being forgiven and forgiving others. And he says in verse 12, when we pray to our Father in heaven, we should pray, forgive us for our sins, just as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. And in the verses immediately following, Jesus says, yes, if you forgive others for their sins, your Father in heaven will also forgive you for your sins. But if you don't forgive others, your Father in heaven will not forgive yours. So you see, being forgiven and forgiving others go together. They go hand in hand. You never find one without the other. Forgiveness is is really meant to bring healing and reconciliation to a relationship. Our relationship with God, our relationship with other people. That is a gift God gives to us by forgiving us for our sins. And it's also a gift we give ourselves as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Because you see, when you forgive someone, it can lead to reconciliation in that relationship. But sometimes it does not work. Or sometimes it will not work. You offer forgiveness, right? But the person doesn't want forgiveness. Or the person won't speak to you. Or maybe the person has already passed away and, it's, and, and, and he or she is not alive anymore, so you cannot extend that forgiveness that you want to extend. And so what you need to understand is that forgiveness is not just about the other person, okay? It is also about you. Forgiveness is really about freeing yourself from the resentment that you have developed, from the hatred that you are carrying inside of you from the anger that hurts and harms your own soul, that's why you offer forgiveness. Medgar Evers, a civil rights activist who was assassinated by a white supremacist, said, when you hate, the only person that suffers is you. Because most of the people you hate don't know it. And the rest don't care. And so when you forgive, you play a part in your own healing. If we do not forgive others, then holding that hatred and resentment and anger can make it difficult to fully receive the forgiveness that God wants to offer us. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, okay? And I think we all know that To forgive someone who hurts you can be incredibly difficult. So maybe the surrounding conversation in Matthew 6 can help help us 
a little bit better understand Jesus' teaching on forgiveness. Because in these verses, Jesus teaches that living a life of faith is not about putting our religion on display. Doing good things so others can see, you know, what a good person you are. Or blowing your own trumpet or horn when you give to the poor. Or praying so that others can take notice and honor you. Jesus says, don't do these things to impress other people. Why? Because God sees what we do privately and quietly. And He knows. He knows what's in our hearts. He knows what our motivations are. Because God knows every de detail of our lives. He knows about the challenges and the struggles that we face. He sees what we have overcome in our lives. He's intimately familiar with our backstory, not just the face we put on for the world. And in knowing all of this about us, who we truly are, the good, the bad, the ugly, God has compassion for us. And He chooses to do what? He chooses to forgive us. And so what if we, like, like God, had a window into what was happening in the minds and the hearts of others, especially those who've hurt us or harmed us? If we could know and understand where hurtful words and actions came from, might we, might we just find compassion that leads to a healing forgiveness. I'm not saying that knowing someone's backstory excuses the harm or the wrong they do. What I'm saying is it may just help us find our way to forgiveness. Here's the thing about the Lord's Prayer. It's not meant to be prayed once and then left behind. No, it's how Jesus teaches his followers to pray. In it, the one praying asks for daily bread for today. Tomorrow we will ask for daily bread for tomorrow. Just like daily bread, receiving forgiveness from God and forgiving others is something we need over and over and over again. It's a process, not a magic moment. It requires practice. And it starts with some reflection. What is an area where you need forgiveness? Is there someone you need to forgive? for who they are or for what they've done? Do you need to forgive yourself for something you did or didn't do? Where do you need forgiveness? And is there something you need to forgive someone else for? Maybe you're not ready to fully forgive today, but maybe it's time to to take a few small steps toward forgiveness. Maybe it starts with a simple apology. Listen, I'm so sorry I did that to you. It's been bothering me and I just wanted to say that. And you move on to asking forgiveness. Will you forgive me? Or maybe you need to meditate on how not forgiving, how not forgiving is affecting your own emotions and your well-being. The resentment you carry or the anger inside of you. It's eating you up much more than it's affecting the other person. And you need to let it go for your own sake. Maybe you need to start by committing to praying for the person who has wronged you and ask God to do inside of you what you don't think 
is possible. Maybe it's time for you to reach out to that person for a conversation. The bottom line is, none of us are perfect, are we? And we all require forgiveness. And we all find ourselves in a position to forgive at one time or another. Can you imagine how different our community and the world and your life might be if we were able to both receive and extend the kind of forgiveness that Jesus extends to us. I mean, what would it be like if, if we all knew each other's backstory and were able to treat each other with compassion? the way God treats us with compassion every day and every moment. Amen. Lord our God, thank you. What would it have been like if, if you were not a loving and forgiving God? So thank you for forgiving us of our sins through Jesus and what he achieved for us on the cross. And I know, Lord, we're easy to, quick to ask you for forgiveness. And you always forgive. That's how much you love us. And yet we find it difficult to forgive others. May your spirit work in our lives to show us where we need forgiveness and where we need to extend forgiveness. It's the gift that you've given us through your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.